Skills, Module 4, Urinary Elimination, Chapter 46. I'd like to remind you to please review the objectives at the beginning of the chapter and also the key terms in blue. Normal elimination of urinary waste is a function that affects all body systems. Clients with alterations in urinary elimination may also suffer emotionally from body image changes. As nurses and nursing students, you need to be knowledgeable about the structure and function of organs to help identify clients' problems and plan appropriate nursing interventions. It is important to know the reasons for urinary elimination problems, to find acceptable solutions, and to provide understanding and sensitivity to all patient needs. Remember that urinary elimination depends on functioning of the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. We will do a quick review of the anatomy and physiology of the urinary system. Kidneys. Kidneys remove, filter, and filter waste from the blood to form urine. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney and it helps to form the urine. It is composed of the glomerulus, G-L-O, M-E-R-U-L-U-S, the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubule, and the collecting duct. In addition to filtering blood and creating urine, the kidneys have other amazing functions. They produce several substances that are vital to red blood cell production, blood, blood pressure, and bone mineralization. They are responsible for maintaining normal red blood cell volume by producing urethropoietin, E-R-Y-T-H-R-O-P-O-I-E-T-I-N. Urethropoietin functions within the bone marrow to stimulate red blood cell production and maturation, and it also prolongs the life of the mature red blood cell. Patients with chronic kidney conditions cannot produce sufficient quantities of this hormone. Therefore, they are highly prone to be anemic. Renal hormones affect blood pressure regulation in several ways. In times of renal ischemia, which is decreased blood supply, renin is released from the juxtoglomerular cells. Renin starts a chain of events that causes water retention, thereby increasing blood volume. The kidneys also affect calcium and phosphate regulation by producing a substance that converts vitamin D into its active form. Patients with chronic alterations in kidney function do not make sufficient amounts of the active vitamin D. They are also then prone to develop renal bone disease resulting from the demineralization of bone caused by impaired calcium absorption. It is in the resorption process that the fine balance of fluid and electrolytes is maintained. The ureters. These are the tubular structures that enter the urinary bladder. Ureters transport urine from the kidneys to the bladder. Urine draining from the ureters to the bladder is sterile. The bladder. The urinary bladder is a hollow, distensible muscular organ that stores and excretes urine. It lies in the pelvic cavity behind the symphysis pubis. The bladder holds urine until the urge to urinate develops. The urethra. Urethra leaves the body. Urine leaves the body through the urethra. The urethra descends through a layer of skeletal muscle known as the skeletal or the pelvic floor muscles. When these muscles are contracted, it is possible to prevent urine flow through the urethra. All organs of the urinary system must be intact and functional for successful removal of urinary waste. Intact efferent, reminder, motor, efferent, outgoing ventral, and afferent, sensory afferent, incoming dorsal, nerves from the bladder to the spinal cord and brain must be present. Remember, intact, efferent, and afferent nerves from the bladder to the spinal cord and brain must be present. Normal voiding invo involves the contraction of the bladder and coordinated relaxation of the urethral sphincter and pelvic floor muscles. Brain structures that influence bladder function include the cerebral cortex, the thalamus, hypothalamus, and brain stem. These can inhibit the urge to void or allow voiding. Urination, also known as micturition, 
is connected to the micturition reflex. This is the relaxation of the urethral sphincter in response to increased pressure on the bladder. As a reminder, bladder comp capacity varies with individuals, but it ranges anywhere from 600 to 1,000 milliliters of urine. However, the urgency to void usually occurs when the bladder is approximately 4 to 600 milliliters. And a normal adult usually voids every 2 to 4 hours. As volume increases, the bladder walls stretch, sending sensory impulses to the micturition center in the sacral spinal cord. It is vital that we understand the process of normal voiding to be able to assess and determine which form of incontinence or which bladder problem may be occurring. Incontinence. It is classified in a few different ways. First way is overflow. Next, stress, urge, multifactorial, or total. Each type has specific nursing interventions. Reflex incontinence is urination without the sensation to void. Urination without the sensation to void. This occurs when there is damage to the spinal cord above the sacral area. Damage causes loss of voluntary control of urination, but the micturition reflex path pathways remain intact. Damage to the spinal cord above the sacral region causes reflex incontinence. This causes loss of voluntary control of urination urination. If a chronic obstruction caused by neurological damage hinders bladder emptying over time, the reflex changes, causing bladder overactivity and possibly causing the bladder to not empty completely. Overflow incontinence. This occurs when the bladder is overly full and bladder pressure exceeds sphincter pressure, resulting in involuntary leakage of urine. Causes often include head injury, spinal injury, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, trauma to the urinary system, and post-anesthesia sedative hypnotics. Hyperreflexia, a life-threatening problem that affects heart rate and blood pressure, is, can be caused by an overly full bladder. Again, hyperreflexia is a life-threatening problem that affects heart rate and blood pressure and is caused by an overly full bladder. It is usually neurogenic in nature, however, it can be caused functionally by a blockage. Then you have stress incontinence, which is just as it says, stress. So when someone sneezes or coughs and they have involuntary loss of urine. Urge incontinence is when someone has the urge, when they feel the urge to urine, then they have no voluntary co control of urination. Multifactorial incontinence is a relatively new category. It has multiple interesting or interacting risk factors, some within the urinary tract and others that include medication, age-related factors, multiple chronic illnesses, and environmental fa factors. So what are some factors that influence urination? Disease, growth and development, medications or medical procedures, sociocultural factors such as having a need for privacy, psychological factors including anxiety and stress, fluid balance, and some other symptoms of urinary disturbances include frequency, urgency, dysuria, polyuria, oliuria, incontinence, and difficulty in starting the stream. Let's review some de definitions. Nocturia is awakening to void one or more times at night. Polyuria is excessive output of urine. Oliguria, O-L-I-G-U-R-I-A, is a decreased urinary output in spite of adequate fluid intake. Anuria occurs when the kidneys produce no urine. And diuresis is increased urine formation. Fever causes an increase in body metabolism and an accumulation of body waste. Although urine volume is reduced, it is highly concentrated. Here's some more terms, some of them that were listed um, and spoke of prior on the prior slide, and a couple new ones, such as cystitis, which is an irritated bladder, and pyelonephritis, which is an infection that is spread to the kidneys. Disease processes that affect urine elimination and affect renal function, the act of urine elimination in both. Conditions that affect urine volume and quality are generally characterized as prerenal, 
renal, or post-renal. Decreased blood flow to and through the kidney is pre-renal. Disease conditions of the renal tissue and obstruction of the ur lower urinary tract prevent urine flow from the kidneys, and that is post-renal. So if it happens before the kidneys, it is pre at the area of the kidney tissue, it is renal, and then if it occurs after the level of the kidneys, it is post-renal. Conditions of the ur lower urinary tract include narrowing of the urethra, altered innervation of the bladder, or weakened pelvic or perineal muscles. All of these can affect urinary elimination. Additionally, diabetes and neuromuscular diseases such as multiple, multiple sclerosis can cause changes in nerve functions that lead to possible loss of bladder tone, reduced sensation of bladder fullness, or an inability to inhibit bladder contractions. Older men often suffer from benign prostatic hyperplasia, which makes them prone to urinary retention and incontinence. Some patients with cognitive impairments, such as Alzheimer's disease, lose the ability to sense a full bladder or are unable to recall the procedure for voiding. Diseases that slow or hinder physical activity interfere with the ability to void. Degenerative joint disease and Parkinson's are all examples of conditions that make it difficult to reach and use toilet facilities. Diseases that cause irreversible damage to kidney tissue result in end-stage renal disease. Eventually, the patient has symptoms resulting from uremic syndrome. An increase in nitrogenous waste in the blood, marked fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, nausea, vomiting, headache, coma, and convulsions can characterize this syndrome. As the uremic symptoms worsen, aggressive treatment is indicated for survival. These include renal replacement therapy such as dialysis or organ transplantation. Medical interventions affecting urination. Pre-op orders for nothing by mouth or an underlying disease can affect fluid balance before surgery. This reduces urine output. In addition, the stress hormone releases an increased amount of antidiuretic hormone, which increases water resorption. Stress also elevates the level of aldosterone, causing retention of sodium in water. Both of these substances reduce urine output in an effort to maintain circulatory volume. Medications, such, such as anesthetics and narcotics, will slow the glomerular filtration rate, reducing urine output. Surgery or lower on the lower abdominal and pelvic structure sometimes impairs urinary urination because of local trauma to surrounding tissues. After returning from surgery involving the ureters, bladder, and urethra, patients will routinely have a catheter. Many medications directly or indirectly contribute to urinary dysfunction. Antipsychotics, antidepressants, alpha adrenergic, adrenergic agonists, and calcium channel blockers can also cause urinary retention. Some medications will also change the color of urine. For example, pyridium, which is used when someone has a urinary tract infection. It will change the color of the urine to a bright orange or rust color. Cancer or chemotherapy drugs can also color the urine and are often toxic. People with impaired kidney function require dosage adjustments and medications that are excreted by the kidneys. Examination of the urinary system including influences micturition. Some procedures such as an IVP or intravenous pyelogram require patients to limit fluids before the test. A restriction in fluid commonly lowers output. Diagnostic exams such as a cystoscope involve direct visualization of the urinary structures causing localized edema and spasm. After the procedure, the patient may have difficulty voiding or may have red or pink urine because of trauma to the urethral and bladder mucosa. So let's talk a little bit about some urinary elimination alterations. As urinary, excuse me. As urinary retention progresses, retention with overflow develops. Bladder distension is apparent. With retention, the client may void small amounts of urine two to three times an hour with no real relief. Urinary tract infections, usually caused by E. coli, leads to the spread of organisms into the kidney and possibly to bacteremia or urosepsis. A asymptomatic bacteria is the absence of symptoms with the presence of bacteria in the urine via results of culture. 
It is not considered an infection and should not be treated with antibiotics. Microorganisms commonly enter the urinary tract through the ascending urethral route. Bacteria inhibit this, the distal urethra, external genitalia, and the vagina in women. Women are more susceptible to infection because of the short urethra and close proximity to the anus. Men are more at risk for infection related to renal disease. Older adults and clients with decreased immunity are also at risk for infection. Organisms are usually flushed out during voiding in the healthy person with good bladder function. What are some causes of UTIs? Residual or retained urine in the bladder is a good medium for bacterial growth, so many conditions resulting in urinary retention such as a kinked or obstructed catheter increase the risk for infection. Poor perineal hygiene, especially from women with inadequate hand washing, failure to wipe front to back after voiding and defecation, or frequent sexual intercourse all predispose women to infection. Also, the introduction of catheters. Clients with UTI will often have dysuria, which is pain or burning with voiding. They may also develop fever, nausea, chills, vomiting, and malaise as the infection worsens. Remember, in our older adult, oftentimes the first sign of a urinary tract infection is alterations in mental status. Cystitis is an irritated bladder. This is caused by frequent and er it causes a frequent and urgent sensation of need to void. Irritation to the bladder may cause hematuria, which is blood in the urine, and urine will appear concentrated and cloudy because there are white blood cells in the urine. Infection can spread to upper urinary tract up the, to the upper urinary tract to the kidneys, causing pi, causing pyelonephritis, which which some signs and symptoms of that is flank pain, tenderness, fever, and chill. Chills, urinary inf Incontinence is involuntary leakage of urine to the point that it is a problem. Urinary incontinence can be temporary or permanent, continuous or intermittent. Urinary incontinence can affect anyone at any age but is more prevalent in the elderly. Causes can be problems with movement, removing clothing, mental capacity, and mental incapacity. Continued episodes of incontinence can cause the potential for skin breakdown, especially in the immobile patient. Some clients may have a urinary stoma to divert the flow of urine from the kidneys to an external source. This can be necessary because of trauma, cancer, radiation, fistula, or chronic cystitis. There are several types or a couple types of urinary diversions that we'll discuss, which include the continent urinary reservoir. This occurs when a reservoir is created from a distal part of the ileum and a proximal part of the colon. The ureters are then embedded into the reservoir. A stoma is created to allow a one-way valve called an ileocecal valve, I-L-E-O-C-E-C-A-L, -E -E for catheterization to empty the pouch. Catheterization must be done four to six times daily for the rest of the, or the remainder of the patient's life. Please take a look at the photos on page 1106 in your text. You also have the orthotopic neobladder. This is an, when an ileal pouch replaces the bladder, thus allowing the patient to void through the urethra using the Valsalva maneuver. A urostomy is the same thing as an ileal conduit. It is a permanent incontinent urinary diversion. The patient has no sensation or control over the continuous flow of urine into the pot. Pouch. Additionally, you will see nephrostomy tubes, these are tubes placed directly in the kidney for direct kidney drainage. Some concerns with this include problems like infection, skin breakdown, and alterations in body image. You want to provide frequent opportunities to avoid in the older adults because they have smaller bladder capacity than a younger adult. Encourage older adults to enter their bladder completely before and after meals and at bedtime. You want to also discourage drinking coffee, tea, brown cola, and alcohol because these have a diuretic effect and increase urinary frequency. Make fluids such as cranberry juice available as part of the patient's fluid intake. Cranberry juice and vitamin C help to acidify the urine to decrease infections of the bladder. Restricting fluid intake does not decrease urinary incontinence severity or frequency. So please do not restrict fluids 
in an effort to decrease incontinent episodes. Avoid routine use of indwelling catheters. If one is necessary, use it no longer than necessary. The risk of infection increases dramatically for catheterized patients. Note that incontinence is not a normal part of aging. Incontinence is not a normal part of aging. And make efforts to assess incontinence and provide interventions to promote return to continence. You want to remember that for, for many that the act of urinary elimination is a private process. As students and as nurses, you need to be cognizant of the many issues affecting the urinary elimination process. Remember that the urinary tract is sterile. The use of infection control principles will help to prevent the spread of UTIs. Perineal hygiene is also an essential component of care. Proper hand hygiene is also essential. Because remember, the single best way the, to, to prevent the spread of microorganisms is proper hand hygiene. Growth and development factors will also help to determine the client's ability to control the act of urination across the lifespan. Infants, children, and the elderly will often experience problems with urination. The young need to learn to recognize the need to urinate. The elderly need to deal with decreased functioning that accompanies aging. Pregnancy affects the elimination process by changes in the body to include early and late pregnancy increasing pressure and urinary frequency. Weak abdominal and pelvic floor muscles impair the ability of the urinary sphincter to maintain tone. Immobility mus and muscle damage during vaginal delivery and or muscle atrophy contribute to problems with urination. Psychosocial issues such as body image, self-esteem, roles, and differences or changes in roles in the family may influence urination. Gender differences also occur as routinely males stand in our Western culture and females sit. Please take a look at the cultural influences on the act of urination in your text. Additionally, don't forget to focus on the older adult in each and every chapter. Urinary problems may not be treated oftentimes in specific cultures. Cultures may also dictate how and when a client urinates. In some cultures, clients urinate in a squatting position. It will be more important to render culturally competent care. The nursing process as it relates to urinary function. As always, in the nursing process, assessment is the first step. The nursing history includes a review of elimination patterns, symptoms and alterations, and other factors. Patterns of urination include frequency, times of day, normal volume, recent changes. Remember that most people void about five or more times a day. Factors affecting urinary alterations include environment, medication, psychological, muscle tone, fluid balance, current surgical or diagnostic procedures, or the presence of disease. Assessment. You want to assess the skin and mucosa. Assess the skin's hydration by looking at trigger and texture. Nurses with advanced skills will also be able to learn to palpate the kidneys and also auscultate to detect a renal brewery. A brewery is the turbulent blood flow through a narrowed artery. Bladder normally sits below the symphysis pubis. Gentle palpation on a distended bladder causes the client to feel tenderness, pain, or the urge to urinate. Normal should feel smooth and rounded. Percussion produces a dull tone if the bladder is full. The urethromiatus. The female client will need to lie in a dorsal recumbent position to expose the genitalia. Using gloved hands, retract the labia to observe the urethromiatus should be a pin or small slit-like opening between the clitoris and above, above the vagina. You want to look for drainage or lesions and ask the patient if this is uncomfortable. Please note, drainage often indicates infection. The male meatus is normally a small opening at the tip of the penis. Inspect the meatus for discharge, lesions, and inflammation. For the uncircumcised client, you will need to retract the foreskin, but always, always, always make sure that you return the foreskin to the non or unretracted position. Assessing urine. We will review this more as we get into chapter 42 with fluid and electrolyte balance. 
However, beginning in on pa chapter 42, page 945, daily weights are the single most important indicator of fluid status. Measuring intake and output at 24-hour intervals gives an overall status of fluid balance. It is important to recognize trends in weight and I's and O's. Remember that an hourly output of less than 30 milliliters for more than two hours is cause for concern and further assessment. Remember that an hourly output of less than 30 milliliters for more than two hours is cause for concern and further assessment. The color of urine should be pale straw to amber color. Urine will be more concentrated in the morning. And also remember that medications and different types of foods can also change the color. For example, beets, rhubarb, and blackberry. Oftentimes, dark amber urine is the result of bilirubin from liver disease. Clarity. This is transparent unless pathology is present, so urine, you should be able to see through it. And then lastly, odor. Stagnant urine has a strong ammonia odor. A sweet or fruity odor is seen in patients who have diabetes or in those patients who are on those starvation diets. In the lab, we will learn how to collect specimens in the skills lab. There are different types of specimen collections that include random, clean, midstream, sterile, or timed. Again, daily weights are the single most important indicator of fluid status. And for every kilogram of weight, that's 2.2 pounds, that is one liter of fluid retained or lost. Every kilogram or 2.2 pounds of weight equals one liter of retained or lost urine. When we're taking measuring intake, this occurs at a 24 hour interval. That includes any and all liquids that are taken in by mouth and that is anything that is liquid at room temperature. For example, jello or gelatin, ice cream, soup, juice, and water. Additionally, it is important to recognize that any type of feeding received through a tube, tube, for example, IV fluids, blood and their blood components, liquid medications, and water to flush tubing is considered intake. Remember that an hourly output of less than 30 milliliters for more than two hours is cause for concern and further assessment. Output is going to include anything that is liquid in output. That includes urine, diarrhea, vomitus, gastric suction, and drainage from wounds or other tubes. Output collection and measurement. You want to save the urine in a calibrated container. We will practice this also in the lab. You will see examples of a Puritan hat and a graduated cylinder. You want to measure and, the record, and record the amount after each void. If the patient is bed bound, you will measure and record the output taken from the bed pan and the urinal after each void. Additionally, if a Foley catheter is or some type of tube is inserted, you want to empty the urine into a graduated container or a urometer or use the urometer on the side of the catheter bag to get precise measurements. Intake and output is calculated by the shift over 24 hours. You want to always report end of shift I's and O's. And remember that an hourly output of less than 30 milliliters over two hours is cause for concern. Additionally, when taking intake and output, each client must have their own graduated cylinder. Do not share. To analyze a urine sample, you must correctly collect it. So again, we will go through the different types of collection of urine. The type of test determines the method of collection. You want to label and transport timely because your analysis should be performed within two hours of collection. If it cannot be performed within two hours, it must be refrigerated. However, if refrigerated, it must occur, the urine analysis must occur within six to eight hours. Now we will review the different types of collection. Random, clean, midstream, sterile, or timed. Number one, random. Random is a clean catch. This is used for cultures and sensitivities of urine. 
The skill is listed in your text in the yellow pages and we will actually practice this in the lab. Random midstream. If you need a sterile collection, you will need a sterile specimen cup. Remember to place the cap, cap side up and do not touch. We will walk through these different collection methods and also observe videos. If the client has a Foley and a sterile collection is ordered, you want to obtain your specimen through the sampling port. You clamp the tubing below the port and allow collection to occur in the tube. Use an antimicrobial swab and withdraw 3 to 5 milliliters with a syringe. You want to place the urine in a standard or a sterile container. A timed urine in timed collections usually occur at 2, 12, or 24 hours. Time begins after the client urinates and ends with the final voiding at the end of the time period. Again, we will practice this in the lab. The urinalysis. Again, first void it to ensure uniform consistency. You may use a dipstick to test a color change. pH. Normal pH for urine is 4.6 to 8.0. This indicates acid-base balance. Acid helps protect against bacteria and it becomes more alkaline if it's left standing. Hence the reason you want to perform a urinalysis within two hours of collection. Protein. Protein is not normal in urine so it is not normally present in urine, but it is common in renal disease due to damage to the renal tubules. Glucose, again, is not normally present in urine, but you may see it with those who have diabetes or if someone has had a large ingestion of glucose or sugar. Ketones are not normally present in urine. This is seen in diabetics who have poor control, and this is the end product of fatty acid uh, breakdown. Additionally, ketones will also be seen in the urine of those who are dehydrated or start on starvation diets or have excessive aspirin use. This is called ketone urea or keta urea. K-E-T-O-N-U-R-I-A. Blood in the urine. Again, this is not normal. Women make sure that if you have to do a urinalysis and it is during the menses, the urinalysis does not need to be taken. Specific gravity. Specific gravity is the weight or degree of concentration of a substance compared to an equal volume of water. This indicates fluid balance by measuring the particles in the urine. A high specific gravity means concentrated urine. Clinically, the patient will probably present with dehydration, decreased renal blood flow, and an increase in antidiuretic hormone. Low specific gravity is diluted urine. Oh, this is the result usually of early renal disease, overhydration, and inadequate antidiuretic hormone secretion. A urine culture requ requires a sterile or clean voided urine sample. Generally with the culture, it takes 24 hours for a preliminary report and up to 48 to 72 hours to, find, to indicate the findings of bacterial growth and sensitivity. The test for sensitivity helps to determine which antibiotics will be most effective if, when treating an infection. Other diagnostic tests include, and these are just some examples, not need, you don't need to memorize them, is the KUB, which stands for the kidney, ureters, and bladder, CT, and the IVP. Remember that each exam has its specific indications in use and oftentimes bowel prep is used. So if specific tests are ordered, please be sure to educate your client. Additionally, if it's an invasive procedure, it may require a signed consent or the injection of dye. You will also need to assess your client's sensitivity to IV dyes. With implementation of care in the event of urinary problem, elimination issues. You want to have the knowledge about impaired skin integrity, disturbed body image, urinary incontinence, pain, risk for infection, impaired urinary elimination, and urinary retention. Again, once a client has had a catheter placed, it is important that placed and then removed, it is important that they void within eight hours. 
Remember that a urinary output of less than 30 milliliters over a two hour period is cause for concern and you need to, the patient needs to be assessed. Catheterization. This involves introducing a tube through the urethra into the bladder. This procedure can cause a UTI blockage and trauma to the urethra. Catheterization can be intermittent, utilizing a straight catheter, of which we will see examples of in the lab, or an indwelling catheter. Some indications for catheterization include accurate monitoring of intake and output for pre-op and post-op issues and other urologic or gynecological procedures, bladder obstruction, and urinary retention. You need a doctor's order to insert a catheter, so this is not one of those in, uh, independent nursing interventions. You must use sterile aseptic technique, of which we will practice in the lab. You will learn how to care for the catheter, and you will also need to check the healthcare facilities, policies, and pre procedures regarding catheter care. To prevent infection, it will be necessary to maintain a closed system. The sites for breakage in the closed system is the drainage bag, the spigot, which is where the urine can be um, released from the catheter, the bag juncture, and the junction of the tube and the bag. If you look in the skills section of your text, you will see tips for preventing infection with their catheterized patients. Catheter irrigation. Catheter irrigation and installations can be used to maintain the patency of an urinary or indwelling urinary catheter. Blood, pus, or sediment can collect in the tubing, causing distension and buildup of urine. Other types of catheters include suprapubic and condom catheters. These are two alternatives to indwelling catheters. The suprapubic catheter requires surgical placement of the catheter through the abdominal wall above the symphysis pubis directly into the urinary bladder. Maintenance of the tubing and bag are the same as for the dwell indwelling catheter. The condom catheter is used for male clients. Again, we will review this procedure in the videos and the lab. Next, on the next several slides, there will be a review of the supplies needed and the procedure for catheterization. Again, we will spend ample time in the lab practicing this skill. Please review the slides and also take a look at the yellow skills pages in your text. But the supplies needed for the procedure include the kit, blanket, pen light, sterile gloves, tape, and a sharpie. In your text, it will say that nurses are the only ones to insert catheters. However, and the your uh, unlicensed assistive personnel will help with positioning and a monitoring of the patients with the catheter. Please refer to your facility policy. Okay, the steps for implementing the skill are listed. Again, we will review these and go over them in the lab. Steps 1 through 8, 9 through 12, 13 through 15, and then listed are the steps to remove the foley. Again, in order to insert or remove a foley, you must have an MD order. Please take note of the proper way to empty a foley bag. This is also an example of a needle removal or needle aspiration to collect sterile urine from the catheter tubing. However, we will learn the needleless technique as the majority of catheters that you will con come in contact with at this time are needleless. Evaluation. Once again, when going through the evaluation phase of the nursing process, I would like to remind you that you are evaluating the effectiveness of the intervention, not the completion of all steps of the intervention. You want to determine in this phase if the client has met outcomes and goals. Evaluate how the client reports improvements that are made. Help the client to redefine goals if needed and revise your nursing interventions as indicated. Okay, listed here is a drug calculations problem for, for your review. If you have any questions on how to manage this drug calculations problem, please notify your instructor and she will, he or she will be happy to assist you.